Thinking aloud. Conversations on the leading edge of knowledge and discovery with psychologist Jeffrey Mishlove. Hello and welcome. I'm Jeffrey Mishlove. Today we'll be looking at parapsychology at UCLA from an insider's point of view. My guest is Dr. Barry Taff. He is the author of Ghosts Below, Aliens Above, Explorations into the Unknown. I first met Barry in the mid-1970s when he was then a graduate student research assistant working in the laboratory of Dr. Thelma Moss, a parapsychology laboratory that was part of the UCLA Neuropsychiatric Institute. I visited Barry at his home recently in Palm Desert, California, conducted a series of interviews with him. This is the first of that series. For those of you who are especially interested in phenomena of high strangeness, I think you'll find this series to be especially valuable. And now I will switch over to the video recorded in Barry's home. Okay, why don't we start, um, Barry? with uh, your childhood, because you're explaining okay. you, you had these abilities since right. you were very young. Um, in our culture, when we're unique in some way, or get attention in some way, people react to you differently than they do to other people. So if you're an, an actor, you're a producer, you're a director, you're an artist, you're a famous politician, you're a scientist, you're an astronaut, you're... Um, whatever the case may be, you're a, a wonderful writer, as I said. People look up to you and they go, wow, isn't that interesting? But what if you're unique in ways that isn't shared by the general population? That being, you're having these ongoing paranormal occurrences around you. When I was young, tele telepathic, clairvoyance, precognition, but another element of that began when I was 10 years old, and I almost got thrown out of elementary school because of that. It was we were having recess one day, it was a warm day, and we have recess, you know, everyone's playing something outside. A little girl named Christine is walking towards me, blue-eyed blonde girl, um, a, a sky blue dress with a big flower on the top. And she's walking towards me, and suddenly this other vision I've had, the ability to see, cut in like Superman's extra vision. I could see under her dress, there was a tube here and a plastic bag and the tube was going into her side. I went up to her and said, Christine, what's that tube and bag? And ah, she started screaming and ran back, uh, got her teacher. They dragged her in the principal's office and she said, what did you, say? oh, I should say, Christine had a colostomy bag and I'm 10, I didn't know what a colostomy bag was. How would I know? So anyway, the principal says, did you sneak in the girl's bathroom or did you look under Christine's dress? I said, I did neither. What do you mean? I said, well, it just turned on. He goes, what? Like x-ray vision. He goes, all right. I said, you know, and I'm going to call your parents. I called my mom. They were, both my parents were, were at work. And he said, what the hell's going on with your son? Was he a, 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 a peeping Tom? And he told my mom what happened, and she said, Barry can do this. What? Barry can do this. He, what, he can look through people like they're glass. It's spontaneous. He can control it to a certain amount. The, some, the principal obviously thought my mother was as crazy as I was. And she said, he can't stop it, but he can turn it on when it's important to him. Yeah, I hung up on her. You're nuts, basically. So he turned to me, and he said, let me make this clear to you. Barry, if this ever happens again, um, and by the way, before I said, my mother, all she kept saying is, he can do this. He can do it. He can do it. But the principal said, if this ever happens again, I will have you thrown out of school. I will have you arrested. You go to jail. So I'm talking to him as I'm speaking to you. And suddenly, I see that he has an append appendicitis scar, an appendectomy scar. It's always kind of purplish, it's keloid. I didn't use that word then, I didn't know it. 
I said, what? You see that, that scar from your appendix being over? What? And it's always different colors. And he turned different colors and blue and red and green. And he said, I don't know what you are, what you are. You're obviously your mother is supporting you. You got a problem. If this ever happens again, you'll be thrown out of school and going to jail. Okay. It did happen again. I never spoke of it. Now, this is an ability I understand. Uh, you've really had, it, it continues to this day. Right, right. It's a... I remember in junior, see, it, it manifested different ways. One of the things it did was, uh, there was a girl named Helene in junior high, and I remember her last name, but I'm not gonna use it. Attractive brunette, big blue eyes. Taller than me, but everyone was taller than me. And every time she got near me, even if I didn't know she was near me, I would black out, I would pass out. And she'd come up behind me, you know, people, kids are walking around, boom, boom. She was epileptic didn't know it at the time but so I learned uh oh this is not good I now remember, there was I, some kind of sympathetic reaction medical there. intuitive our body's sensing this stuff um it, it just happened and then my mom says you could really do this there's something wrong with dad you know my father her husband can you tell me what's wrong now they already knew and he hadn't had anything done about it I said to my mom is it visibly discernible no Okay, sat next to my dad on the couch. And I, oh, I have a hiatal hernia. My mom said, you guessed. I only said one thing, and I was right. So how did you even know? Uh, I, the, I mean, the word just came out. Well, that was a little older at that time, I but I, I knew where it was. I knew where I could feel pain and distension of the lower abdomen, and I knew it. The, um, it, it, there's so much of this in my life. In, for example, in 1973, the lab was up and running. I was had been there for four years now. We're talking about the UCLA Parapsychology Lab was part up. of the Wait. Neuro Psychiatric Institute. Yes. So, anyway, I met a girl there named Carol. She visited. We became friends, and we started dating. But who cares about that? So we're having a good time together. And I met her at her place once, and I said, "Oh, Carol, you've got a tumor. It's right here. What? It's." Tumor right here. It's benign. She goes, "What do you? What tumor? What what tumor? How do you know? know it? How do you see it? I I can't tell you. Um. I don't want to hear about it. She finished her her education at UCLA. She went got a job for a big company. Had to have insurance physicals. They found lump, tumor. Thank God it was benign, as I told her it was. And she said, "How do you know it's benign?" I don't see calcium around it. You what? Okay, so they took it out. The uh, the ability I have is good, but it also interferes with things. Um, but we're, we're going to bounce around here, different stories. When the Dark Knight came out, two thousand what eight? I think it was. So it was went to a screening of it with a friend of mine, a girl I knew from UCLA way back when. She came back to town. We went to the Director's Guild Theater, movie starts, and suddenly my bladder is burning and cramping it. I'm going, oh, oh my God, what's going, oh, oh, and suddenly she's, oh, I got a call from my daughter, I got to leave. So we had, we'd driven there so, separately. She leaves, the minute she leaves, I'm fine. I watched the movie, which I really enjoyed. Uh, next day, uh, she calls me, the girl calls me, and she says, uh, the name was Lauren, how was the movie? Good. I said, yeah, but I had a lot of problems with my bladder early on. She goes, that's really odd. I, odd. I've had a really bad bladder infection for a week. Okay. Next time we sit five seats apart. <laughs> <laughs> but it gets worse than that. Uh -huh. When some movie I was seeing like 20 years ago in Century City, sat down, a stranger sat to my right, and suddenly my kidneys were killing me. And I spoke of it to my friend I was with, and this man to my right said, you know, it's odd because my kidneys have been killing me. Okay, get up, move to another seat. And it goes away. Yeah, because I'm far enough away. Um, In other words, proximity is important here. Yeah, exactly. Let me take a drink. I'm getting a little dry here. Um, the, um, I remember it was at a party like in 1972 or something in Hollywood. I met this guy there named David, and shook his hand, and I said, whoa, I can't be near you. Why, you have a rheumatic heart. How do you know? I can feel it. Okay. Um, 
the in 1991 I think it was or something like that I don't know I forget, late 90s maybe old girlfriend popped up hadn't seen her in a year she looked great no lines no wrinkles no fat but she was acting really weird so I didn't want to bring her into my place we're outside it's a warm day spring and she's wearing a halter top and uh, her name was Linda so we're talking and suddenly I said what's all over the top of your chest it looks like a jellyfish what I get closer to her I go oh you better go see an oncologist why because your, your chest is riddled with tumors what you're riddled with tumors. yep correct riddled riddled with tumors mm. you had to have a, 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 a vasectomy of both breasts had to be removed and reconstructive surgery um I was on a date in 1983, blind date. A friend of mine was a casting director. He set me up with those friends. Beautiful girl, looked like a young, short Jane Fonda. Very attractive. So we met for dinner, and he says, oh, your friend said you're psychic. Like, what can you do? I said, well, I can diagnose you, because you can, well. So I do my thing, and I said, hmm. Oh. You have a follicular cyst in left ovary. You have endometriosis. And you have a lower GI problem. Oh, I'm, what? What? I repeated it. She went to your OB, OBGYN. Yeah, the follicular cyst was there, left ovary, endometriosis. And the doctor said, who told you this? This guy I went on a date with. He's a doctor, not a medical doctor. What? How could, so the doctor, her doctor called me. How do you do this? I can't tell you why. Tell me how you breathe. You'd understand what conveys from here to here. No. Um, it's, um, this has been an ongoing problem with me. Now, I presume you haven't worked professionally as a medical intuitive. No, I, actually, one of my friends about 20 some years ago wanted to see if I could make money doing this. I said, well, several people have paid me money, but it's like they're in desperate need of help, and I don't want to deprive them of hard money. My job is to help them. I tell them, this is what's wrong with you. Go to your doctor and check it out. I never tell them what to do, ever, because I'm, I'm not a medical doctor. So, um, But this led you to pursue an interest in parapsychology. Right. Yeah, that it was part and parcel of it. Uh, it's... How did you get connected with the well, laboratory? I one more story. Okay. Yeah. To show you how remote this thing can be, literally. Yeah. In 2000, late 2014, I met this girl online, never spoke to her, and she looked like a young Joan Collins, just beyond beauty, incredible beauty. So I'm looking at her pictures and just overwhelmed. I got the sudden feeling this is a really sick girl, and she's like almost half my age. I'm going, and I'm looking and going, whoa, I, she's sick, and she feels like a blood, blood can her, her, blood chemistry shot, problems with her heart, problems with her GI tract, and I finally talked to her, her name was Nicole. And I said, look, I have to say something. As beautiful as you appear to these pictures, you look sickly to me. She was born a blue baby. Her umbilical cord was wrapped around her neck. She almost died. She's been plagued with medical problems her entire life. So I said, I can't meet you, why? Because I'd be sick around you all the time. And I, I, I I can't do it. But these are the type of experiences that led me to end up in the UCLA's parapsychology lab. Um, I was having them a lot growing up. Lost a lot of friends. They were freaked out because of me. So at the time, I knew there was a woman named Dr. Thelma Moss who ran the parapsychology lab. I wrote her, no responses. I called her, messaged the switchboard. There was no voicemail like there is today. She never responded. Okay, forget it. I met one of her graduate students when I was an undergraduate and he I told him and he said okay I talked to Dr. Moss she finally called me or I called her or something and she said let's come over to my home Beverly Hills minutes from where I lived with my parents I could have almost walked there so I meet her I knew nothing about her other than her work in the paranormal no nothing about what younger what she did I so she said, okay, and she threw me your keys to hold. You do psychometry. Yep. So I described things, this and that. And I said, hmm, I see a fat, blue-eyed, blonde woman named Shelly, and she's screaming all the time. Blah. 
her best friend was Shelley Winters. Mm. And it's an accurate, it's not an unflattering description of her, yeah. unfortunately. So there are other things I said. So Dr. Moss became interested in me. So she ran a study on me, starting in late 69, maybe early 70, lasted by the eight, eight to 12 months, was published in a medical, in a refereed medical journal. Mm -hmm. And okay, so you're psychic. Okay, then why me? Why not my friends? Why not my family? Why are these things happening to me? And that was what motivated me. It's, I don't, I'm very skeptical. People tend to embellish and exaggerate things and lie. And I, once you get beyond that, there's an extraordinary, something extraordinary going on. We could ignore it, bury our heads in the sand, or we can jump at it and grab it, try to understand it. My interest wasn't proving this, because I knew it was real, I lived it. My interest was, I'm coming to understand what it is, how it worked, and why it worked. So in that regard, after the study was done with me, um, they would have, they were trying to do something on campus, the other end of the campus away from the NPI, and describe what's going on. And I could do it, it was very easy to do. Remote viewing, mm -hmm. which is, Remote viewing is just basically telepathy, clairvoyance, and precognition bundled together with another term. That's all it is. So the study was done, it was published in a medical journal. Okay, big deal. My interest became, can I take normal, emotionally healthy, emotionally stable people who are not in psychotherapy, who are not under, they're undergoing psychoanalysis, to help to train them to enhance some inherent abilities they have or had. Can it be done? Well, started running these with the, in my website, there's an article, it'll be in my new book, it's called Psy Training, no, Learned Psy Training to be Psychic. And I use a simple learning paradigm. And that is, if you're getting impressions about something, paranormal, remotely accessed information, and you're given immediate positive feedback and reinforcement, to those experiences, you will learn to know what to pay attention to versus what to ignore. You get rid of the noise, you want the signal. So we had these groups around them in a conference room in the NPI on the seafloor, and once a week, sometimes twice, but mostly once. And it was amazing, the continuity, the consistency of it, the accuracy of it were so extraordinary. And my article on my website, speaks of that. Uh, some interesting bits. There was, um, I want to think, there were so many things that happened. Early on, Dr. Moss would send people to the groups and we didn't know who they were. They were dressed normally, they were men and women, mostly men. And we learned later they were from the DIA Defense Intelligence, from DARPA, CIA, ONI, uh, DLI, all these, but we didn't know who they were. Mm -hmm. They would give us the gate. What we did was this. Let's say you came to our group. We didn't know who you were. You then gave us the name of your wife, first name. Our job was to access what information we could on her. We didn't know, even know who you were. And then what would happen was we would ver verbally espouse our perceptions in a sensory-deprived environment. You couldn't see or hear a damn thing. And then after it was over, we would replay the tape. You would take control and we'd say, every time you hear a comment that's accurate about what we said, really accurate, stop it. If it's not accurate, don't stop it. So let's say, again, we didn't know you. We just spent 10 minutes rattling off our impressions. You take the tape, we start to scroll. Let's say it's your wife. Now, now when you say we, these are the, the, groups. the people in the it's Psy the development right, class. They, right. they went from as low as eight or nine up to maybe 15 at, the, mm -hmm. at a time. Every person, type of person, academicians, artists, actors, um, lay people working different jobs. But okay, so, we do the session, you take the control remote, and you're playing back the tape, and oh, we describe, we describe this woman, yeah, her looks, her height, the home you live in, and you're going, yeah, yeah, whoa, yeah, easy to do. When the people that were sent to us from the intelligence military groups, we describe information that was so state specific, that was so focused, that on one occasion, we described the development of a trident 
Titan sub and the D2 missile when it was nowhere near being deployed. They were still developing it. And they demanded we surrender the audio tape, which we did. Now, it had a sign of national security. Of, yeah, 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 okay. So the intelligence community became really interested in what we were doing because we could do it again and again and again. They wanted to work with us. Well, UCLA went, no way. They had been political suicide. To be formally linked to parapsychology would kill their endowments. They were already involved with psychosurgery, orbital undercutting, and, you know, the, the MK Ultra crap before I was even there. Dr. West had that on his resume. It wasn't good. So they don't care what funding would come in. They didn't want it. Now, who is Dr. West? Dr. Julian West was the head of the Neuropsychiatric Institute. And he thought we were crazy. He didn't like Dr. Moss. He fought us to the nail. We knew we were on borrowed time. We were living day to day there. And the last thing the NPI and or UCLA wanted was to be formally associated with the paranormal through a grant or funding that came through an intelligence. In, in other words, they allowed Thelma Moss uh, to, to do this research on her own dime, basically. Correct. Unfunded. Yeah. But we got offering of funding and from the intelligence community, you say, well, that's well, no, not going to happen. Thank you. Then I filed grant applications with the NSF and the NIMH. They were interested. In the, lab stuff, the National Science that's Foundation, that's National, National Institutes of Mental Health. Yeah. And you say, well, said, we, we want nothing to do with it. End of story. But we kept doing these groups. And it, it, was, it, was, what, it was so many incredible things that happened during these years. We did thousands of these. Thousands of them. And the continuity is pretty amazing, the results we were getting. Um, one time there was this girl who came to the group, and I can't give you her name because she's fairly well known today. She's a retired physician. We knew her a little bit. I knew a little bit. I didn't want her there. Dr. Moss wanted her to go. She came in, and she decided to be a target. She gave us a name. Forgot his name. Forgot his name. A male name. We start describing a huge home with big glass walls, high foliage around, very beautiful, striking, and a kitchen that was lined with empty jars of bacon bits. Bacon bits? And we described the man, we're trying to pronounce a name, we could Hemel, Hurl, Hall. Uh, okay. Then we start describing uh, he's being beaten badly and mugged hard, bad, really bad. So, you know, we go through the feedback session. This woman, this girl takes the remote and she says, well, you just bet this house perfectly. You got it down. Lines, empty jars of bacon bits. Yep. His name was Hormel. He was the, main, the, the meat king guy. So it was accurate. She said, he's never been mugged or beat. When you talk, okay. Days later, she calls the lab. Remember the session the other day? Yeah. Well, that night, this man was being viciously beaten and mugged when we were doing the group. But she didn't know it. And this guy was in San Francisco. So when, when you do the group, you, you have everybody together in the same room? Yeah. yeah. And they're all listening to each other's no. impressions? They're no, they're spontaneously emitting. They're not paying it, listening to each other. It was everything. Everybody was separate. Mm -hmm. And one of the most outstanding things that we got bored with the real time. Oh, no, no, okay. This woman came. We had a lot of entertainment people coming through. I didn't know why. I didn't know about Thelma's background as a writer and an actress mm -hmm. at the time. So this guy comes in and he brings us a stunning woman. Forgot her name older than me, maybe 12, 15 years older than me. And she gives us the name Al. Al could be anyone, you know. We start describing about 6'2", bulky, stocky, blonde brown, medium brown hair, blue eyes, weird voice, violent as hell, explosive, um, very anxiety-ridden, depressed, um, no coping mechanisms at all. And we kept seeing him beating her and beating her and beating her. So we finished the session. She takes the control. The man she was sending was her husband, Albert Salmi, the actor. You'd know him in a heartbeat if you saw him. He was in Three Twilight Zones. One was an hour version. Um, he, uh, 
again, a very strange voice. Very, he always played heavies, bad people, villains. And uh, yeah, it, it was right. He used to beat her a lot. And we warned her, well, we said at one point that you better get out of here or he's gonna kill you. Now, years, some years later, almost to the day, he killed her and then he killed himself. So, not good. There was a, but the most extraordinary thing that happened dealt with our first venue into the precognitive mode. We could do the real time stuff over and over, month after month, year after year. We could do it. Mm -hmm. Let's try something different. Let's go forward in a week in time. Our job was to describe the first target of the next week in detail. So, sensory private environment, talk ourselves into a hypometabolic state, altered state of consciousness. We describe a beautiful, tall, blue-eyed blonde woman. Now, each person in your group is making a separate description. Correct. Correct. They're writing it down? No, no verbalizing. Ver tape recording? Right. And then your job is to sort of find the consensus? But to see if they're, yeah. To, to hear what everyone says and see if there's continuity for one, but also the specific accuracy of what they're saying. Mm -hmm. So, the la this last session of this group on a Wednesday, we described this tall woman, blue eyed blonde, pantsuit, beige, very professional looking. We strive, describe a three star home in the Hollywood Hills, a baby grand piano, and we see a tall man, six four maybe, dressed in black, black pants, black shirt, black boots, black hat, black mask, black cape, black gloves, an imposing belt, and a sword. What? Zorro. Oh, wait, wait, we hadn't got there yet. And we thought we were losing our minds. So next week, new people come in from third parties. Every new person gets a sealed envelope with a piece of paper and a number from one to 12. They come in, they sit down wherever they want. Oh, in our early, in our session, we named the one chair the person would be sitting in. There were 24 chairs in that room. Each chair had a number on the bottom of it, which you could not see unless you flip the chair over. So we goes by, the new people come in. Okay, we roll the dice. We tell people, open up your packets. Who, if your number matches the dice, let us know. The woman goes, oh, it's me. We didn't remember, it was a week ago. Take the tape, play it back. Anything that's accurate, stop it. We didn't even know who she was, stranger. Tall, blue-eyed, blonde, perfect. How are, how are these people solicited? Through UCLA, mm -hmm. ads in the Daily Bruin, word of mouth through Dr. Moss's efforts, through regular members that participated with it. it. They were coming in so fast and friendly, we had to actually diminish our intake because we could have, the whole room would have been filled with people. But let me... Uh, and, and the people in the class, were the, did they stay with you for a some, long time? Some did, some didn't. Um, it takes a lot to alter the way we perceive things. We're taught to deal with sensory cognition, input. And if we start getting input, more subtle input, that's remote in its nature, we tend to ignore it. What this group was doing was reversing that role. Ignore what's around you. Focus on the, your mind's eye, what you're seeing inside your head. And I'd say about 5% of the people showed really, really incredible ability. It'd be like if you took a bell curve so at one end, you get nothing happens. The other end are superstars. They're somewhere in the middle, they get the ups and downs, variables, the weather, their moods, their personal lives, whatever. And we had some of the most, one of the best responders was a man named Steve. He was a writer and kind of, he was my age, I thought he was 20 years older than me. Kind of odd, but very gifted. And uh, there was another guy named Jim, another guy named Richard. All were incredibly good, but it took time to counteract the way we normally think. Um, you know, that during learning paradise, time is, paradigm is simple. You positively reinforce what's correct. You get positive feedback, reinforce. You learn what's real, what isn't real. What's real, 
what isn't real. So with that, let's get back to this thing. Yeah. We describe the tall man in black. Right. The woman takes the control. The very first thing she says before she starts to take is she said, um, how do you know who I am? What? How do you know who I am? And we went, what do you talk? Her name was Tony. Tony Williams. Who's Tony Williams? She said, my father's Guy Williams, who played Zorro. She did, the clothes she wore was exactly what we described. She sat in the one chair we named a week earlier. Could have been coincidence. The house, three-story home, baby grand piano, yep. Her father was Zorro. What are the odds of that? Good, wait a minute. When did you make this tape? A week ago. A week ago. I didn't know. I was coming here two hours ago. I don't, and I was chosen randomly. How? Yeah, exactly. Oh. I got a weird feeling that down deep, when the paranormal research ends, because we understand it, we're not going to like what we learn. Parts of it, they're going to run counter to everything we know and believe in. We know the past is immutable. It's fixed. We assume the future is random and chaotic. What if it's not? What if there are elements, the, the information, one of the things we came to learn in these groups was that the past information still exists. Your future's information already exists. Information at different locations is accessible. The question is, can we access it through a mechanism and put it to use to benefit the human condition? That's what it comes down to. And what we saw, so depending on what you call the phenomena, will determine what it is to you. If it comes from the past, oh, retrocognition. The future, precognition. The distance, clairvoyance or telepathic. Mind to mind, telepathic. It's all the same thing. We're accessing information, period. And, but wait a minute. If that means everything coexists, I said, wait. And I thought, well, what? This is in the 70s. And, uh, What's the best model for this consciousness? I was, when my car was in the shop, I make a bus to UCLA for a couple of days and came home at night. I could see, I'm in the bus. I could see the windows. I could see my reflection in the window. I could all see outside, all in the same frame of reference. And I thought, it's multiplexing. It's holographic. Every equally distributed information space and time and at this level everything coexists the information is there question is can we access it and then is can we change the shape of things to come um how many degrees of freedom do we have what if we had a machine that could see the future independent of our consciousness with all the noise the primary process and we, we saw a future we could not change. Then what? 1976, I think it was. Yeah. Dating a girl. Now, I've been a pilot since I was 16. I know a lot about aviation and flying. It's I used to love it. But I never became a commercial pilot because I'm too small. My vision wasn't good enough. So, uh, anyway, with this girlfriend... And you know, I'm sound asleep, and in my dream, I'm piloting a 747. It was red and white, that was TWA. I'm in the cockpit, suddenly all the controls go dark. Dead stick, and the, the drone of the engines go out. We're falling and falling. We're on the approach to South Africa, and ask me how I could know that, because you don't fly high enough to see continental divides like that. And we hit, and Boom, I blow out of bed, I'm sweating profusely. Oh God, I just crashed into seven. What? They had a perfect service record. They just came out a few years earlier. There have been no crashes, 747s. I wrote down, 747 TWA on approach to South Africa. On what day? What week? What month? What time? I don't know. A few days later, the first 747 goes down on approach to South Africa. It was a TWA. Oh. So if this happened today and you called the FAA or Homeland Security, you'd be arrested. Okay, we just think that you caused the event rather than perceived it. Early on, okay, so anyway, the groups we were doing, 
they were very consistent. The ability, um, they blew me away. And a lot of the people had problems coping with this because it opened them up to a new vista of their perception they'd been ignoring. Yeah. And some of them had really volatile reactions. There was um, a man who came in and we didn't know who he was. And we described him murdering someone. He jumped up, slammed into the door, it was pitch black, and knocked himself out. Then he got up again, ran out. We never saw him again. Another time, there was, um, I think there was a, uh, oh God, there's so many of these events that happened. Remember, this went on for month after month, year after year. When the lab closed, we moved off campus to uh, offices in Westwood. What, what year did it close? 1978. Mm -hmm. So we had more to do. We didn't finish. So we moved. My friends who were psychologists had offices. and We moved to their offices. Then when they closed, we moved to homes. And then it just stopped because everybody moved away. But the best performers had the most difficulty coping with this newfound insight. It's Imagine if you're, you're blind, God forbid. You can't see and suddenly you're given sight. Oh my God. Look at that gorgeous. Look at all the trees and the flowers and the sky. Oh, the ocean. You're overwhelmed. My God. Once this aspect of consciousness is opened through their own mechanism, through their own pro the, it's a surprise. You're overwhelmed by it. Again, it's like a blind person, a blind person finally being given sight. And we tried another session. May I ask sure. you, Barry, since you had the same abilities since childhood, I'm assuming it was natural for you to integrate it. You didn't have that problem yourself. I learned, well, except I eventually learned to keep my mouth shut in certain environments rather than deal with the legal manifestations or ramifications of what I said. Um, and other people found the same thing. One, it's easy to open that door, but closing it is really a bitch. And give you another example that we, the forward, the precognitive effort. Weeks later, let's try the same thing. It worked so well. So um, <laughs> we did it, and everyone kept seeing fire, 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 fire. What fire? We smell this fire. I thought we were losing our minds. Okay, next day I'm up back in the lab. Fire engines are coming to the NPI. That room we were in caught fire. Over. Sparking a spark from the outlet behind the curtains, set it on fire. No wonder why we're seeing fire. It was imminent. Um, it, it's the bottom line with, with the paranormal in an informational aspect is that I believe that you could perceive any place we want on the earth if you can access that information. Call it remote viewing. There is, there is no future, there is no past. It's a giant now. Can you separate this from that and that from this? Yes. Um, there was, um, I'm trying to think. There's, the mental element of this, to me, seemed normal because I've lived with it my entire life. I thought everyone should be able to do this. Maybe they can, but they've never been trained to work on it. But the group did amazing things, and Dr. Moss was always sending people, submitting them actors. We had some directors who were regularly attending. And uh, one guy, I can't mention names, because one of the persons deceased, but I think they have family. He came in, brought in from a director who was attending. And a um, famous actor, you'd, you'd know him in a heartbeat. And he gave us a woman's name to target, and we start talking. Wait, this is a man or a woman? It's a man or a woman or a man? She was a transsexual. And he freaked out. Lights came out and he's left. We found out it was accurate. Uh, it, the basic problem with all of this is, what are we to do with it? Once we know more, as we do now, what are we to make of this? And what was interesting, I remember reading a lot of the skeptics rebuttal from the remote viewing data that was generated, and they did really incredible work, that, oh, it was coincidence. It was luck. When we did the thing with um, Zorro's daughter, we guessed we probability. Come on! I crunched the numbers for what we did before. It was so astronomical. You had a better chance of being able to fly without a plane. So the mental stuff was... 
beyond it. But then occasionally things would happen in the group that went beyond the mental element, the psi element, or the ESP element. They went to paranormal, um, psychokinetic, or, so this one girl came, she was a poltergeist agent, I met her in a case in 78, or 70s, anyways, it's, she came, and she was somewhat reluctant to participate. So this pitch black room, this giant red ball of light, bigger than a human head, comes flying out of her, across from everybody, whoa, everyone jumps back, the lights come on, and she's in a fetal position, and she's in a chair, and she left, and she never came back. Um, but, so th this is the, the real time paranormal stuff. And it was amazing. And even though I talk about it like it's no big deal, it was like eating your best food for dinner every night. It's again and again. Why it worked this well, I don't know. But we had a lot of people, oh, and then this is interesting. Now, remember who Carlos Castaneda was? Yeah. Okay, now, I never met the man. I wouldn't have known him if he was standing next to me in a room. So one, during the lab, Thelma says, Dr. Moss says, keep track of your dreams, anything interesting, write it up. Bring it in. Okay. Most of our dreams are irrelevant. So, one night, going to sleep, trying to go to sleep, and I hear crackling and snapping, like high voltage static or um, Velcro being pulled. And I look up at, just beyond the foot of my bed, there's a woman wrapped in flames, sheathed in flames. Huh? What? And it got closer and closer, and it got to, right to the foot of my bed. It was a blonde-haired, blue-eyed, blue-eyed, blonde-haired woman. She was sheathed in flames. She was screaming, but I could hear no sound. I felt no heat, but I could see the flames. She was wrapped in it ah, like this. I got up, looked around, nothing. I brought it in the lab the next day, and Dr. Moss told me a few days later, that night, Carlos's girl was immolated in the fire. I didn't know he had a girlfriend. I didn't even know what she looked like. My description was correct. So my input screwed up the experiment. Uh, what was the experiment? We don't, it was to keep, Carlos was trying to do something with affecting a lot of people's dreams. Oh, okay. So, yeah, I had So, a, in other words, Thelma had been in touch with Carlos. Yeah, she knew him. And uh, he had asked her to engage in an experiment involving dreams. Well, she asked him. No, he asked her, and she agreed, and she told different people in the lab, and, you know, uh, I was sort of her psychic pet. Uh, so, yeah. she told me, and, uh, it was amazing. It was really, really amazing. Um, and did you say she, she died? Dark. Yeah, yeah. She died. She was immolated. The woman was immolated. That oh. The girlfriend was consumed by the fire. Oh. Now, I didn't know he had a girlfriend. I didn't know what she looked like. I sure didn't know that she was consumed in a fire. So what happened? Back in 78, I began having dreams, early, or maybe late 77, mm. about the lab and they're very terrifying dreams the dreams were they were all in the lab dr moss myself and carrie and 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 oh, oh forget of all the other people that francis and whatever and dr Wa Ma dr west comes in and he's yelling how much he hates what we're doing and why we're do you're crazy this is bs we're wasting our facilities and services on you i'm going to shut you and then before he could finish it in the dream, the whole room starts to shake, a violent earthquake, and we're bouncing, we're bouncing, and oh my God, and we're suddenly falling, and then we stop. What? And then we're moving horizontally down the street, the room. We look out of the window, which faced the west from the lab, and there's a wooden plank up there. And there's a woman, a, 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 a looks like a decayed corpse of a woman there, and she's whipping horses. And there's a, a damaged, a really horribly mangled dog next to her, German Shepherd, and it's pulling us. And then suddenly, we stop. So I open the door to go out. Now this is all in your dream. Still in the dream. Yeah. Open the door to go out. No hallway. No NPI. What's this? So we walk, I walk out and I walk down the ste down steps rather than a hallway. 
And I turn back and I see the room is now an, an 7th, 18th century or maybe 19th funeral coach. Glass walls, black gas lanterns on each side, and the corpse-like woman is there with the corpse-like dog. And I go, "What's go? What's? Why are we here? I brought. I, you're all dead, and I brought you here to bury you. What? You're all dead. We're, I'm here to bury you. Oh my God! So I woke up. I was drenched in water. Oh, so I came in. I told Doctor Marsh, "Well, we, maybe we might die in the room in a major earthquake, or." The lab will die as an entity. And, okay, not long thereafter, Dr. West comes in. It's over. He's going to shut us down. You, you, when you say not long, within... I say within about a month or two. Month or two. He comes in, and he's going to shut us down. See, what a coincidence. I have this terrible dream. The lab is going to die as an entity. We're not going to die, but the lab will die. So Dr. Moss, Dr. West leaves, and I ran out in the hall. Oh, Dr. West, can I speak to you a moment? Okay, I'm busy. Just two questions. Do you have a sister? Oh, Troy, the, 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 uh, the corpse-like um, in the room when he saw the placard and the, the decaying woman, he recognized it as his sister. He went, oh, my God, that's my sister. And that's her dog. We were in the dream. In the dream, yeah. He, yeah. He, he sees this decaying woman. Mm -hmm. Oh my God, that's my sister. The dog is her dog. So he jumped it in the dream. Yeah. So sorry about the continuity jumping around. But um, in, the, in the hallway, I asked, you have a sister? I did. Oh, she died of cancer. She wasted away pretty badly. Okay, she had a dog. Yeah, she had a German Shepherd, big one. But he was mangled, in a, terribly mangled in a car accident. He died before she did. Why are you asking me these questions? I can't tell you. So in the midst of all this chaos, all this primary process, this um, uh, Roger Corman horror venue with the dark earth and the, the fog over it as we're walking down, was reality. Yes, we did die as an entity. Yes, Dr. West, uh, Dr. West did have a sister who died when she was younger and a dog that was mangled. So reality in the midst of fantasy. Yeah. And... That was when the lab ended, and um, yeah, it, it, it was an amazing place to be.